Illinois Institute of Technology, and he will speak to us about topological recursion from A to Z. Well, thank you very much for um, inviting me um, to, to this uh, occasion. It's, it's a pleasure, and uh, <coughs> I apologize if uh, I'll be losing my voice uh, in the middle of the talk. I, this, this month was very rough with teaching committees and everything, so I've been basically teaching nonstop almost every single day, so this is a pleasant way of teaching. So. Uh, in this talk, uh, there will be A and Z, and my goal is to explain both uh, A and Z and how they're connected, how to go from A to Z. Uh, A will stand for A polynomial, and there will be lots of Zs. But one particular Z that I'll try to emphasize uh, carries a hat, so uh, that's, that's going to be somewhat special. And uh, it will be about uh, topological regression, or uh, some old work uh, that, that uh, we did with Piotr, uh, motivated by uh, this wonderful procedure uh, originating from pioneering work of Einard and Orantan, and uh, then used by many others, most notably by uh, Daira, Fuji, and Manabe. <coughs> and the procedure um, is uh, can be very general. That's that's where its power. It, it's it's very broad and, and useful. And it can compute uh, what we call open amplitudes, so this uh, numbers W and G for n punctures and uh, genus G, given the data of parametrized uh, algebraic curve. So uh, in this talk, or in, in that work with Piotr, we were applying this uh, to very specific algebraic curve. So uh, I'll explain to you that in knot theory, there is uh, a curve playing the role of kind of spectral curve. So it's basically crying out for application in this uh, topological recursion. And um, motivated by that work of Digraph at all, we were basically asking what would happen if we try to apply this powerful machinery of topological recursion to, to this uh, spectral curve that comes from topology. So. Uh, in particular, I have to thank Piotr for many things I've learned about topological recursion. So he is kind of my lifeline. And uh, as you'll see, my knowledge of topological recursion is almost limited to this paper. And he knows a lot more. So if you ask me really hard questions, luckily he's in the audience, so I can always uh, go back to him. And um, our goal was to see how some of the uh, relations and quantization of, of this uh, spectral curve naturally appear in the context of topological recursion. So uh, this is pretty old work. And uh, the reason it's uh, useful is that recently it resurfaced in uh, recent developments. And uh, if you wish, this is uh, like a trailer of a movie where I, in the first few slides, I'll briefly tell you roughly what this talk is going to be about. So. Um, this is uh, a branched cover of uh, one of the complex planes uh, viewed as, I mean, th th this is this uh, apolynomial curve that we'll be discussing. And um, the topological recursion, which is uh, like a local procedure, allows you to compute this invariance, W and G, uh, turns out to have very interesting applications, in particular, it plays a role uh, in, in various TQFTs that uh, Dupé already mentioned in his talk. And uh, my job is to uh, explain uh, how it connects to a polynomial and how this, in some sense, old results uh, about W and G uh, find a new life. So that's, that's, uh, that's the goal. Um, but first, uh, I'll uh, assume very little knowledge of this a polynomial curves and uh, spend some time uh, introducing them, giving you uh, basically a brief survey of, of what they are, but also describe applications from old days because they'll be extremely helpful as a background for uh, understanding this most recent developments involving uh, this, this objects uh, that had in particular. <coughs> so a polynomial is a um, polynomial in two variables. I'm going to call these variables x and y. and um, it basically defines the character variety, the representation variety of uh, any three manifold with a toral boundary in SL2C. So SL2C is a complex group that plays a very special role in uh, 
various uh, branches, including uh, three manifold topology, which we'll discuss later. And uh, if you ask, uh, what are the uh, representations of fundamental group of your three manifold, uh, which has uh, a torus boundary, viewed from the viewpoint of the torus boundary, what you'll get is precisely the algebraic curve in C star cross C star. Why? Because the fundamental group of a boundary is very simple. It's uh, Z cross Z. It's fundamental group of a torus. In particular, it's abelian, it's commutative. Therefore, if you introduce two SL2C holonomies around the two basic curves on the boundary torus, they can be simultaneously diagonalized. And uh, that means diagonalized in the maximal Cartan of SL2C, which is C star. So that's how you get two copies of C star. And here I'm ignoring the quotient by the wild group of SL2C, which is Z2. So what you get is uh, algebraic equation uh, in C star cross C star. So this um, a polynomial was introduced uh, quite a while ago by, by this gentleman. And uh, it's not so hard to work out concretely in examples. For example, if I give you a not complement, such as complement of the trifle not shown here, it's a manifold with a toral boundary. So it satisfies all these conditions. We can diagonalize, again, our holonomies along the two basic curves on the toral boundary. So x and y are precisely the eigenvalues of these holonomies, valued in C star. And then you ask, uh, which of these representations can be uh, extended to the not complement, to the three manifold? Because if you ask just about toral boundary, any values of x and y allowed, but uh, extending this into three manifold cuts out or removes roughly half of them, so you only get in general, mid-dimensional subvariety. So here is the fundamental group of uh, trefoil not complement. It's uh, actually the simplest example of the braid group, uh, as it happens. And uh, you can just substitute in this relation uh, generated by n b. You substitute uh, instead of a and b two by two matrices with complex values and ask up to conjugation what do you get, and you get this polynomial in variables x and y, which are again eigenvalues of um, meridian and longitude. So these are some basic properties of this uh, A polynomial. So you can view in this way A polynomial as invariant of a knot, even though it's defined geometrically through the knot complement, really. And uh, later on, I'll ask lots of questions, in particular, these recent developments, they beg for many, many questions. So this geometric interpretation will be kind of uh, motivation for asking analogous questions. Well, first of all, you notice that if you're, if a polynomial basically, uh, zero locus of a polynomial describes all possible SL2C representations from the complement of a knot, it should include abelian representations. And abelianization of fundamental group pi 1 is H1. And for any knot complement, that's Z. So therefore, any and in fact, uh, generated by longitude. So for any, uh, sorry, by meridian, so for any uh, not complement, this A polynomial will have a factor y minus y, uh, y, y minus 1. So this comes from abelian representations that factor through H1. And this is precisely what we saw in this previous example. There was indeed a factor <laughs> y minus 1 times something. And this times something may be very interesting, but y minus 1 will always be present. So that's uh, uh, due to abelian representations. And again, they'll play a very important role in our discussion today. Now, another fact is, if not as hyperbolic, then uh, you definitely get something else. You, you, you have more than just abelian representations. And this will play a role later. And um, then there are various facts about the symmetries of this A polynomial. For example, if we're talking about not complement and homology sphere, it contains only even powers of x. Uh, I'll probably uh, assume that my x is uh, x squared, which is normally used in the literature. So then um, it behaves very nicely under mirror symmetry. For example, these are two pictures of left-handed and right-handed trefoil. These are different knots. They're obtained by uh, doing mirror image of one of the other. And at the level of a polynomial, this amounts to reversing the degrees of one of the variables. It could be either x or y. And um, the reason 
you can do either one because uh, when you do it simultaneously on both X and Y, that's actually the same as uh, Z2 while group action that uh, is always a symmetry for any knot. So for any knot it has this symmetry, but if you change just one power, uh, reverse one power of either X or Y, then um, you go from knot to its mirror. Uh, finally, it has uh, integer coefficients, which is uh, kind of a new, uh, in interesting, um, interesting fact uh, that uh, always was source of curiosity, maybe connections to number theory, and 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 so on and so forth. So what I. What does is skill mean? Skill. Uh, up to up to overall power. Okay. So in fact, it's it's defined uh, through th th this. Um, character variety, uh, or rather how it projects to the character variety of the boundary torus. And therefore, if you multiply a polynomial by any power of x and y, it's not going to change things. So therefore, convenient normalization could be where this is just equal. But uh, I don't think people care too much sometimes. So, so the Alexander polynomial also satisfies a simi similar symmetry yeah. condition. So can you obtain the Alexander polynomial? They're closely related. I'm going to come back to this. Uh, at this point, uh, th th they share some of the properties, but uh, at, at this point, they would be really hidden. So for example, there is a statement that some of the roots of this A polynomial with respect to one of the variables are related to the roots of Alexander polynomial. Oh, okay. But it would sound as a very cryptic uh, kind of statement. Natural question would be, what's the explanation? Where does it come from? And uh, later, I'll try to show you uh, something bigger, which uh, projects to Alexander polynomial and A polynomial. And that would be kind of unifying so place for them. Um, well, it, it captures uh, all of SL2C uh, representation, so it surely knows something. But the question is, does it extract it in exactly the same way as Alexander polynomial? So that's not obvious a priori. But it knows a lot more. This polynomial is much stronger than the Alexander. Yeah, that's the way to think about it. But actually, uh, in this kind of survey, I included something which will unify them. So uh, it, it will answer your question, hopefully. So um, yeah, some more geometric facts. Uh, so if you plot its uh, Newton polygon, uh, often people do this, removing this abelian representation, namely the factor uh, where y equals 1. That's, that's sometimes called the abelian branch. Um, you get usually something nice. In particular, the slopes of this uh, Newton polygon uh, encode the slopes, uh, boundary slopes of incompressible surfaces inside the three manifold. So you have very nice relation to something kind of enumerative where you study is the minimal surfaces embedded in, in your three manifold, very much in the spirit of Mix and Yao, for example. Um, <coughs> you can play, uh, I mentioned that it has integer coefficients, so you can uh, try to play uh, with, with number theory uh, of uh, such algebraic curves. So uh, obvious thing that, that we do in number theory is we try to count number of points of uh, algebraic variety over some finite field uh, with p or p to the k elements. So you can do this in the case of a polynomial. Um, this actually will be a little bit subtle, uh, and, and this will hunt us throughout the entire talk. But even in this number theoretic aspect, this reducible representations, they cause this a polynomial curve to be very singular. So uh, it, it has uh, many singularities, and therefore you have to normalize it or do something about the singularities if you want to define what you mean by counting. Um, What's the genus? Um, well, uh, in this case, uh, so arithmetic genus and actual genus not always agree precisely <coughs> because of this fact. Right. So uh, for figure 8, uh, which is this example, uh, genus is 1. But again, it's, it's singular, so uh, 2. I think it's one, but, but arithmetic is actually three. It's one. Yeah. It so z, z is zeta function, or what <coughs> is z? It's first. That, that's right. So z, z, z is the, uh, yeah, the z is the first z in, in my, my many z's and z hats. So in this case, this is just a uh, zeta function. I'll show you the definition on the next slide, which packages uh, count of these uh, uh, points. Um, 
on, on, on algebraic curve. And here, E tilde is the normalization. And in particular, I'm using the one from very nice paper by Guy and Tan and Bertrand, where they studied very similar questions and similar resolutions. Uh, my goal is not going to be really number theory, so I'm just including this sort of for completeness because this is such a cool problem. And again, if we have an algebraic curve with integer coefficients, this is a very natural thing to do. We think of algebraic variety and again for for curves. This is of course a uh, very rich theory, which in one direction is Ashley Shimura, in the other direction, Taniyama. Um, uh, <coughs> Well, conjectures uh, which uh, relate uh, the um, L functions uh, produced by counting points on curves in the same way uh, we did it, and uh, various modular objects, uh, L functions of modular forms. For example, if you have a Fourier expansion of some modular form F, uh, this uh, rich theory, which now is a theorem, establishes that for any L functions produced from algebraic curve, that's uh, the <coughs> uh, Dirichlet version. There is uh, a correspondence to L function produced from such modular form. And in this case, if you apply this to um, a polynomial of figure eight naught, you produce this particular uh, weight two cusp form at level 15. Uh, these are first few coefficients. Because I'll have lots of other Q series appearing later in the talk, uh, I decided to include this because one of the questions already from the beginning is, how is this series related, which is produced by obvious or standard number theory, to something that I'm going to discuss later? I have no idea, so this is one of the amusing questions. So if anybody has any thoughts, uh, I would be glad to discuss this further. So this is. It's, it's, it's all about the to Hitch and Simons. The group will be a <coughs> So defined, uh, yeah, a polynomial is basically defined as SL2C character variety, so it backs to be in the world of SL2C turn Simons. So I'll, I'll explain some of this, yes. <laughs> um, but anyway, so if you uh, apply this. Uh, Melian transform or, or the this this rich theory due level to level fifteen. Yes, uh, yes. That's a very important level for Wiles's proof of the uh, for mock conjecture. Uh -huh. I have no clue, but again, this is just one example. So I'm sure that if we take some other knot, so this was the simplest hyperbolic knot, uh, it, it will be something else. So therefore, I, I'd love to connect it to maybe some other Q series invariants. But also, I'll, I'll be glad to hear how it appears in Wiles's proof. Well, uh, for I mean, you, you people discuss modularity in, in completely general context, even for Calabi-Yau's, right? So, therefore, doing it for algebraic curves is, is very natural. Again, I don't know what's the. No, the zeta function for five two is not the modular. But is it something nice? I, I, n I never looked at it, so I'll be glad to discuss it. Yeah, at least there's seven yeah. examples where the A polynomial of uh, knots or hyperbolic uh -huh. manifolds are elliptic curves. Well, definitely, well, I don't want to restrict to elliptic curves, but I want to ask, uh, do the zeta functions satisfy something nice? Uh, or do they have any special properties and so on? Well, then, then... If they're not elliptic, they're not modular. It does not kill the question. That, yeah, that, as, as Jan says, that does not kill the question. So again, I, I included this just uh, to show you that there are many different questions that we can ask about a polynomial. but. Um, and, and again, I'll be glad to discuss whatever is possible or we can say about it. Th th this is very tangential to, to my main direction. So in fact, um, I want to emphasize that if you ask about uh, its uh, physical interpretation in Chern simons theory, uh, the shift uh, um, is from algebraic structure to symplectic structure. And, and this is something that um, one of the main lessons that physics is basically teaching us. So if uh, the way I presented it, it's a nice algebraic variety. Uh, it's, it's very tempting to use algebraic geometry at every step, including counting of these points over finite fields. But from the viewpoint of chern simons theory, as I'll try to explain, this is actually not how we should look at this apolynomial curve. So it is holomorphic, that's true. But more important, it's holomorphic Lagrangian. And Lagrangian here is the, the key word. So uh, that's, that's important. Moreover. Uh, here it's kind of boring that it's Lagrangian with respect to the symplectic form on C star cross C star, 
but uh, it, it, it's automatically true. It becomes much more non-trivial for three manifolds with higher genus boundaries or several components, which we can easily uh, work out and generalize. But even in this case, uh, even viewing this as a Lagrangian submanifold and quantizing, applying the usual theory of quantization, leads you to something very rich and interesting. And uh, finally, I want to point out, uh, although I'm not going to discuss it in detail, that uh, this algebraic curve, uh, this A polynomial, plays the same role as Cy Berkwitten curve. Uh, and this is beginning of connection to interesting supersymmetric field theories, some QFTs uh, and BPS states that physicists like to study, which in this particular case is uh, basically beginning of what's called 3D, 3D correspondence. So, yeah. K2 Lagrangian. Hmm? They are always K2 Lagrangians. Uh, what's this, what's this holomorphic? It's not just arbitrary. Probably it's some quantized yes, period. Yes, yes, so of the quantized period. period. So yeah. that plays a very important role. Yeah, so, so that, that's, that's right. So in fact, I'll explain why periods uh, should be quantized. So uh, my, my uh, interest in this uh, was piqued uh, when I was still a graduate student. And uh, basically, as, as soon as I finished all my graduate student projects, I, I jumped on, on, on this problem. And the problem was a uh, very intriguing volume conjecture So <coughs> that came up um, in late 90s, originally proposed by Kashaev in the context of Kashaev invariant, but then if you combine it with a statement of Murakami squared that got reformulated as a statement that if you take a Jones polynomial and color Jones polynomial at the nth root of unity and take the limit where n goes to infinity, you recover the hyperbolic volume of the knot. So that's the conjecture. So I was extremely intrigued by this and uh, thought that this is super fascinating, so we should definitely find some physical home for it or interpretation. And um, that's, that's uh, how I got sucked into the story, and I'm still there. So in some sense, what I'm reporting to you today is uh, progress after 20 years of, of uh, trying to build it. And I'll explain what are the delicate points that I wasn't able to overcome back in the day. But first thing that it became fairly clear and obvious is that, well, uh, instead of thinking of hyperbolic volume, it's convenient to think about uh, flat SL2C connection on the knot complement, because these are uh, equivalent uh, descriptions of the same entity. And uh, it's uh, SL2C uh, that, that uh, it makes a lot more sense, rather than uh, thinking about volume geometrically in terms of hyperbolic metric on, on the knot complement. So physicists know the statement as the fact that classical SL2C Chern-Simons theory is equivalent to classical three-dimensional gravity with negative uh, curvature. So then the punchline of, of uh, looking in this, uh, into this statement was that if you take a limit of SU2 chern simons theory, which is the one that computes the n color Jones polynomial, you basically forced into the SL2C world. And this is not so surprising from representation theory point of view. For instance, if you have n-dimensional representation of SU2 and you send n to infinity, it basically starts looking like either discrete series or principal series representation of SL2C, because your weight space now uh, gets spread out and uh, you have no limits, no bounds. So in that sense, and in the same sense, how you can approximate uh, discrete series or principal series representation of SL2C, you can approximate uh, SL2C chern simons theory by such large color limit of SU2 chern simons theory. So that's, that's in some sense, one sentence snapshot of all of that story. It would be totally useless if it doesn't produce something new. It, it should explain known facts. And then for me, the goal was to explain the volume conjecture. But it should also produce some new interesting directions. And uh, <coughs> it led to various generalizations of this volume conjecture, which uh, is something that uh, will play a role in our story. So you can turn various parameters, basically knobs and bells and whistles, and you get generalization of the statement that came from Kashaif and Murakami squared. For example, you can start varying representations, the groups, and uh, include <coughs> parameters uh, such as H bar or uh, holonomy that I'll describe next. In Charles Simon's theory, it's uh, actually a very good exercise to ask uh, what is the holonomy around this orange line uh, if you 
try to study, the, say, for example, SU2 turn Simon's theory and consider a Wilson line or not colored by n dimensional representation. So that would be the left hand side of volume conjecture. It turns out that this holonomy, it's a simple computation, the holonomy is going to have eigenvalue x, that's the same x that we saw in the context of a polynomial, and um, it basically is eigenvalue of the meridian of the node, and that turns out to be q, which is the quantum parameter, exponential of h bar, uh, so h bar has to do with quantization, uh, to the power n. n is the n-dimensional representation of SU2. So this uh, is um, simple calculation, so therefore you quickly get uh, the statement that you can generalize this uh, limit if you not just consider uh, color going to infinity, but also just the variable q in such a way that q to the power n remains fixed. So in the original volume conjecture this was true, but with a very specific value of x. Roughly speaking, x is exponential of 2 pi i. But you can now keep x generic, and this leads to so-called generalized or parametrized volume conjecture, where you consider this double scaling limit and send the color to infinity in the color zones, and uh, also q to 1, but in such a way that q to the power n remains fixed, and in this way, you can basically discover the space of SL2C flat connections because um, what appears on the right-hand side is integral of the form log y dx over x. Notice that if I differentiate at once, I get precisely the symplectic form dy over y wedge dx over x, uh, where the A polynomial leaves. So <coughs> from the viewpoint of chern simons theory, not only this variable x fixes the boundary condition on the meridian of the knot complement, but the whole knot complement basically defines a quantum state, and if you remember quantum mechanics, the basics of it, a uh, classical limit of a quantum state is a Lagrangian submanifold. So what you should think of a polynomial curve as defining actually Lagrangian submanifold in C star cross C star parametrized by x and y with this uh, symplectic form. So this is nothing but the formula from quantum mechanics applied to this, uh, to this state. So <coughs> then you can ask what happens if you try to quantize uh, this whole thing. So first of all, if you quantize uh, C star cross C star with a symplectic form, you obtain the algebra which is known as quantum torus. It's uh, algebra of x and y now carrying the hats, meaning that they're not commutative, and they q-commute. And um, the state in this quantum mechanics uh, defines uh, now should be replaced by operator. So A, which was a polynomial relation in these generators x and y, will be now quantum operator, and it should annihilate the wave function, which is precisely Chern Simon's partition function. M, which is what? For uh, so M here is a not complement. Always. Uh, always. Well, at least in my talk, but you can also consider. Uh, the same logic applies, for example, to link complements or three manifolds which have genus G boundaries. S very similar things will happen. So basically your algebraic equations which define space of flat connections on the three manifold will be uh, quantized into operators which should annihilate the corresponding partition functions. So <coughs> What's interesting is that this algebra that you get uh, by quantizing it doesn't depend on the choice of your real form of the group. For example, John's polynomial is computed by SU2 chern simons theory. But this algebra, as we later explain in paper with Witten, but uh, I also provided an argument back in 2003, um, is actually independent on the choice of the real form. So therefore, a polynomial, which is SL2C object, actually is something that annihilates uh, SU2 partition function as well as SL2R partition function. So for example, if you're interested in studying Teich-Müller theory where SL2R would be more relevant, uh, it should also be annihilated by, by this A polynomial. The this, uh, no, th th this can be at any level, so it has to be, it has to hold it uh, at every order in whichever variable you use, either h bar or q, uh, it, it always has uh, to be the case. So in the context of SU2 theory, this is uh, precisely the statement that 
they had annihilates the Jones polynomial, and this was independently proposed around the same time by Stavros, and uh, both of us were young and at Harvard. That's, that's, what do you mean that's how question? I define a kind. Let's not confuse the uh, theorems and conjectures. Yeah, this is conjecture, of course, yes, no, no, yes. A hat has been defined to annihilate polar geometry. Well, but uh, what I'm trying to explain then from physics is actually uh, it's defined differently. It's a result of quantizing and uh, okay, conjecture. Sorry, okay, let's go there. What's the definition of A hat from physics? It's basically deformation quantization of C star no, cross no, C star. How do you define it? What do you mean, how we define it? How do you quantize that function A? Well, uh, you have C star cross C star with variables x and y. You have some polynomial expression in that. So therefore, you have an element in the ring of polynomial or functions in x and y, and you just apply deformation quantization to that. But there are choices. So what do you, no, you, you choice replace x by multiplication. Okay, so... so <laughs> <laughs> right, so... To be completely honest, right, we don't know how to construct a head from a quantization procedure at the point. The only definition we have is the one Star Wars gave together with Tang Li. Well, That's not a conjecture. And that was the theorem. Okay, so... They proved there exists an A-head with certain properties that kills this guy. Yes, I agree. I mean, this is very nice statement and I, I totally agree with this but uh, what I'm trying to explain is that there is a point of view that from physics it's an operator that annihilates a partition function yeah, so that's and uh, I would love to see that we had some explicit geometric <coughs> Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you examples where it can be implemented and it, it will lead to something beyond wha what we knew. So in some sense, it is implementable procedure. I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain that. I, so I made the same comment for Piotr's talk. Yeah. So first of all, A-hat exists, that is the theorem. Second of all, it's not called quantum boring conjecture, it's called A-J conjecture, which says that that A-hat that exists, when you put Q equal 1, you get the A polynomial. And that is the conjecture. And it's called the AJ conjecture, not called the quantum volume conjecture. I don't know why. Well, I think. Uh, rename a conjecture that exists and existed for a long time. Uh, but, but for example, Don, uh, at some point, uh, jokingly pointed out that, that both of us proposed it at the same time and he even called it attributed to SG squared using the fact that both you and I have the same initial. So. Uh, I, I'd rather be friends and, and uh, tr try to say that there are independent points of view leading to the same result, then, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's very nice to deny I another I alternative I point of view. Priority questions should be in the discussion part. Okay, okay. Sergey, but why you call it recursion? <coughs> what is the recursion here? Well, I was planning, t I mean, I'll, I'll use it as a recursion um, L later, for example, if you use x equals q to the n, then this relation, for example, that x and y q commute basically means that operator y becomes the shift operator. So it shifts the color by one. And we'll see several implementations of this. And just, just to yeah. If you go one slide back. So this one? I'm not taking part in any priority discussion, <laughs> don't get me wrong. But what I would like to see is actually a really honest construction that starts with this a of x comma y and constructs a head because I think that would be extremely interesting. Well, that's basically what we try to do with Piotr, for example, uh, and, and uh, it, it, it can be done in several different ways. I, uh, for example, one cheap way could be to provide some uh, boundary conditions, right? how this uh, quantization procedure goes. But we actually discussed in great detail what's the origin and how this ordering works. So. Uh, in some sense, I, I agree that there is interesting work to be done there, or, or I th that was already done, and uh, I'm not presenting this, I'm just summarizing it, but... Yeah, what I mean is a description uh, where you start with any not, and you just produce a head. That's what I would like to see. Well, actually, just to comment, there yeah. is a very general conjecture of Kantsevich that for any motivic Lagrangian, and K2 is motivic, there is a uniquely defined the corresponding D module or DQ module, like in this case. So it's not about knots. It's about yeah, deformation. Yeah, I, I totally agree. That's a conjecture. No, it's, it's a conjecture, <coughs> but it's conjecture. it has nothing to do with knots. Right, it's I, it's just, I think, yeah, I would love to see an explicit construction. 
Well, again, uh, uh, we, we implemented uh, with Piotr this procedure uh, for in a number of ways and uh, generalized. Uh, it wouldn't be, um, again, I, I'll present to you, I'll, I'll show you in a, in a second, generalization, which uh, comes exactly from this physical perspective. So I think denying that uh, this fact is there and, and uh, okay. there, there is this. I mean, uh, indeed, we, we didn't prove a theorem. I'll be completely honest about it. But we gave a procedure which, uh, by now, we implemented on zillions of knots, and it doesn't seem to come to an end or run into difficulty. So it's not a theorem, but at the same time, it's a procedure that always works. So Zamolodchikov has this famous quote that physicists don't have to give proofs, they just have to be right. So <laughs> uh, I, I completely agree, we didn't give a proof, but I, I, I wouldn't agree that we didn't do anything or didn't give a procedure. You have a construction that works for any knot. Just put the word conjecture, as Jan was saying, for conjecture. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, I, I think we're happy to, to mathematically. It is a procedure. Yes. It's completely algorithmic. I start with A, and you give me AF. Yes, that's, that's what, at least conjecturally, we believe, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, <coughs> okay, in particular, it leads to various other generalizations. So, uh, th this uh, apolynomial curve, as I'll try to explain, should be viewed as a Lagrangian submanifold, and uh, in this case, in C star cross C star, which is space of flat connections on the boundary torus. Or uh, I'll refer to it as a uh, Hitchin moduli space of this boundary torus because from one pom complex structure point of view, these are the same spaces. So again, physics gives you a lot more. So it gives uh, generalizations uh, which lead to amusing new statements. In particular, one of them already back in the day was that there is a two parameter deformation of a polynomial, commutative deformation. So there are variables which uh, are usually called a and t, and a polynomial arises as a specialization at a point where they're specialized to something like one minus one. <coughs> so x and y are variables, and we still should think about x and y parametrizing the phase space where a polynomial defines Lagrangian submanifold, and that's our symplectic structure that I mentioned earlier. But a and t are additional parameters, so they're not part of phase space. Uh, again, th this is base of the uh, parameters. Now, <coughs> this uh, generalization now has a better connection to, for example, Alexander polynomial, and we see even a better version in a second. So for instance, if you now specialize, uh, take this deformation, which again is uh, at the physics level, there is a computational procedure that physicists can follow our physics rule and compute this, uh, this deformation in every single case. And uh, if you specialize x equals 1, you find uh, something interesting that has to do now with the Homfli polynomial. If you specialize another variable, what you find is a connection with augmentation polynomial of so-called contact homology, which does now have very close connection to Alexander polynomial. So this is related to, roughly speaking, categorification of Alexander polynomial and was studied by Lenny Ng and, and others. So in example that I showed you before, the A polynomial is rather simple. It has a billion branch uh, y minus 1 and has non-abelian branch uh, y plus x cubed. Uh, but if you include the A and T deformation, uh, it becomes uh, rather complicated. It's still quadratic uh, with respect to variable y, but it doesn't factorize anymore. Nevertheless, I, I want to emphasize it still has singular points, so it's still uh <coughs> Interesting, and that again has to do with uh, reducible connections and so. More a uh, well, yes, it's uh, it's it's a rational function just as before in some sense with respect to x and y. It's it still uh, defines an algebraic curve. So, from the point of view of Hitchin, the AT are what? So this is a good question. So uh, this A and T. Uh, I don't know their geometric interpretation, so uh, over the years people studied various perspectives and uh, they have interpretation, for example, from the viewpoint of gromov eaton theory or rather its version that's related to Lenny Ng's and Tobias's work uh, of on augmentation polynomial. So that describes one of the variables. So some of them have semi-geometric interpretation, but it would be nice to have much simpler interpretation. 
That's right. So you can write exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. But that's going. Uh, yeah. So I'll combine uh, non-commutative and commutative in a second. That's yeah. But uh, what I want. I mean, uh, again, I hope your your can be friendly to physicists that uh, they have their own way of computing this. And that's OK. Uh, if, if they have their own rules, like Feynman diagrams, to compute for you commutative deformation even before going through a non-commutative one. So uh, is it published so they don't know yeah, no yeah, reference? Yes. Well, the, the, the this is from 10 years ago. So yeah, that's, that's published. That's joint work. Uh, I should have mentioned that uh, this is based on many papers, uh, uh, including uh, the one with Piotr and, and Hiroyuki, where, where I took this from. Yeah. Uh, so here is an example, for example, for trefoil knot. <coughs> so now you can combine it with non-commutative deformation uh, using this quantization procedure, now thinking about x and y as, as a phase space. And then, of course, you get another, again, operator that depends on q, but also this deformation parameter is a and t. So I'm not going to write for you this uh, a hat in this case very explicitly, but what we can do is play the same game and ask who can be annihilated by, by such an operator. So we noticed before that algebra of x and y, which don't commute but rather q commute, can be nicely realized by having x variable to multiply our function by q to the n, and uh, if it's now uh, n is, is becoming the role of a uh, variable, then y operator basically will be shifting the value of n by plus 1. So on such functions pn, clearly x and y satisfy the desired algebra. So therefore, let's ask, uh, what could be annihilated by, by this deformed beast? It uh, it's now depends on the parameters a, q, and t, and so on. Pn is, uh, we, we're asking uh, who could be Pn annihilated by, by Pn is a uh, solution to this now Q difference equation. No, no meaning yet. Yeah, no, no meaning yet. Again, conjecturally, of all these variables, conjecturally, yes. And we have procedures to compute it for every node. I think it would be nice. I don't know if it has been defined or not over this first. But that's converse logic, right? So, then that right. A hat. That's true. The yeah. Is that yeah. Exists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as well as PN, which but but even this statement was first actually predicted by physicists, right? So that's partly uh, the, this this work we did with Piotr. So therefore, you should at least here be grateful to or acknowledge mm -hmm. us physicists, poor physicists. But so. <laughs> well, no, not this PN. This PN, I don't think it existed. No, but so example, you can take the just no, no, no. Thi this PN, it has a, q, and t. It has three variables. This guy didn't exist. Actually, this is something physicists predicted way before it was computed mathematically. No, it does. It does. Uh, okay, <laughs> so. Let, let's stick with this guy. Uh, Stavros, you don't have to be so mean to physicists. I mean, uh, you already made it very clear. But uh, it, I don't think it's nice. I think I would rather prefer us to be friends and uh, generous to each other rather than trying to be so harsh. It's, uh, I don't think it's nice. Um, so again, you can compute a hat. It's an operator. It's a Q-difference operator. You can ask who satisfies this recursion relation. It's a very concrete question. It's part of nature. I mean, you can easily write this uh, recursion explicitly. It has still order 2, because it was quadratic and variable y, which is now becoming the shift operator. The only thing is that now all those coefficients, which I call alpha, beta, gamma, they depend on um, uh, a, q, and, and, and this variable t. So <coughs> you can ask, uh, again, who satisfies this recursion relation. And a uh, natural solution would start with 0 for all small values of n, for example, uh, less than 1. 
um, you can normalize it so that p1 is equal to 1, and then basically solve for all the subsequent values of p2, p3, and so on and so forth. So here is a surprise. It is a concrete procedure. So what you find is that solution starts with 1. That was initial condition. Then next, turn, next uh, is polynomial expression in a, q, and t. Then another one is a bigger kind of polynomial in a, q, and t. All of them have positive coefficients. And uh, surprise, surprise, um, this uh, is something that's uh, meaningful and seems to be interesting because these are positive integer coefficients, so they're counting something. And uh, later on, this was identified as a colored Homfli homology, namely n is still the color as before, and Homfli homology is triply graded by a and Q grading, uh, which come from Homfli polynomial, but also has T degree, which is homological grading. And it was defined, in fact, it is defined by Hovana, Frozansky, Ben Webster, and many others. So it's a well-defined object. And this actually is something that physicists did before. These computations were done mathematically. So again, this is a good uh, testing ground where physicists produce a conjecture and mathematics is basically like an experiment, a justification that this prediction was indeed correct. So, yeah. There was this just algebraic modes. There was this interpretation in terms of Hilbert schemes. Yeah. Hilbert schemes yeah. and so on. That yeah, that came much later. That of course confirmed this, and that was still a conjecture. But again, uh, I think uh, it's it's nice to acknowledge all such. The results. So, so if n is a color, does it mean that q to the power n is one or not? Uh, if if n is is a color, sorry. Yeah. In in June sense. No, it does. Uh, q to the n can be uh, now anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, just yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, <coughs> I should. I don't want to take too much of your time because uh, I, I realize th through the questions, which I appreciate, uh, but uh, I don't want to uh, delay the end uh, by, by more than half an hour. So uh, <laughs> let, 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 let's try to <laughs> uh, proceed, maybe save questions for, for later because I'm, I'm still in the review part, basically. So. The, the lessons is that uh, this A polynomial or, or this physical interpretation allows you to think about it as Lagrangian submanifold. So it describes uh, a state in sl 2 c and simons theory that uh, in turn leads to various generalizations in different directions where you can turn this quantum parameter or uh, x variable to produce this generalized volume conjecture as well as A and T parameters and so on. They will actually play a role, so I want to mention it. So <coughs> Another thing that uh, we quickly see here is that the space of states in this SL2 feature in Simons, that's basically what we used, uh, is a quantization of C star cross C star, and that can be parameterized or has a basis uh, of X and N or M and N, depending how you look at it. And um, unfortunately, I didn't have more time to emphasize this, but I should have that. Uh, it, it can also be viewed as a brain, as, as an object in the Fukai category, in a uh, Hitchin moduli space of the boundary. Even though here, just in the case of a torus, when you go to multi-component links or higher genus, this, this plays an important role. And even here, it actually uh, plays off. So anyway, we, uh, l l let me save this for now. I'll, I'll come back to it. So what we did back then with Piotr uh, is, in particular, we tried to apply topological recursion to produce this state, this uh, partition function of SL2 feature and Simon's theory, it depends on variable x, which is parameterizing where we are on this A polynomial curve, and choice of alpha tells us about the choice of branch. So what you get is a recursive way of computing this uh, partition function as expansion in H bar. So that's a formal procedure, but topological recursion gives you a nice way of doing it. So, so branch is a connected component in the critical locus? Yeah, so branch is, uh, if you view a polynomial curve as a cover of the x plane. Oh. So x is uh, one of these variables of x and y, and it's convenient to, it's associated with meridian, so it's convenient to view this a polynomial curve as a branch cover of that. So there is a billion branch, which is very boring, 
So that's basically y equals 1. That's why I draw it flat. But then there are interesting curve branches. And in old days, a lot of attention, for example, is volume conjectures and so on. They were focused on geometric branches. So they're non-abelian. So now, uh, the way it comes up, and this picture is from this recent work with Ciprian, Manolescu is uh, something interesting happens even on a billion branch. So this reducibility or which also were causing singularities in a polynomial curve and so on plays important role. <coughs> so you can approach it a number of different ways. So with Piotr, we approach it using topological recursion, which is the subject of our discussion here. With Don Zagir and others, we approach it uh, using uh, other techniques. But question that we wanted to ask already back then, 10 years ago, and that's actually the main part of the talk. Uh, finally, I get to it. So uh, again, hopefully we won't overstay too long. Uh, question is, can you take this formal series uh, or h-bar expansion, which is perturbative, and turn it into something non-perturbative? Something that really depends on q, and, and not just h-bar such that uh, q is exponential of h-bar. So in other words, when q is exponential of h-bar, you're expanding your q equals 1. So that's, uh, that, that's, that's all nice. But can you try to resum it and rewrite it as an expression in q, as in particular as a q-series? So you basically change the domain of your expansion from vicinity of point q equals 1 to a vicinity of the point q equals 0. Well, uh, I'll, I'll try to argue that it does. So there are various uh, such Q functions that, that were studied and proposed, uh, at least in the physics literature. And uh, many of them uh, have various kind of properties. So here, um, I allude to the fact that uh, such chern simons partition functions actually have interpretation or connection with enumerative invariance. And they were already studied in um, late 90s by Gopal Kumar Vafa and others. And the uh, question is, can we indeed incorporate this SL2C Chern Simons partition function and topological recursion into that world, or can topological recursion produce this Q series? So, <coughs> various uh, proposals were made, but uh, they fail in one way or the other. So I'm, I'm blaming myself that, that, that uh, with our collaborators, we were basically trying to produce it. And either we came up with something that uh, has nice integer coefficients and can be interpreted as counting BPS states or some invariance, or, uh, but, but it wasn't a TQFT. So for example, you could produce a not complement, but you couldn't do gluing. You could not uh, feel the toral boundary and uh, produce a closed manifold out of it or take two such uh, manifolds with toral boundaries and glue them together, or vice versa, or both. So there were all kinds of versions until very recently uh, there was this variant with a hat so as uh, you can anticipate, the hat appears because it was an improved version of something else. So out of many different attempts that, that didn't work. And uh, what I want to show you is basically a very simple example uh, that, that uh, we should have noticed already back then. So what we did, we computed all this h-bar expansion, and it depends on x, which is uh, the, this variable parameterizing the point on the apolynomial curve. But then, <coughs> Uh, so you get this double expansion in x and h-bar. So it's easy to see that this function is basically anti-symmetric with respect to x, because every power of x appears with uh, opposite sign when it's reversed. So therefore, if it can be resumed into something that's function of q, it has to be of this form. So let's focus on particular power of x. Then if you stare at it with a naked eye, you see that what you get is coefficients 1, h-bar, h-bar square over 2, h, h cube over 6, h to the 4 over 24. So I now kick myself for not looking at this more carefully back then, because obviously this is just q, right? So if you look at some other coefficients, such as, I don't know, 5 uh, over 2 and so on, you quickly see that indeed it perfectly sums into series, which is series on both q and x. And even though all these results were available back then, uh, somehow we didn't look carefully enough and then just missed this part. So the point, uh, which is main point of this uh, recent work with, uh, that Du told you about and um, that, that we did with Chiprin, is that it can be resumed into double series in variable x, which is that same holonomy that, that we discussed in the context of a polynomial, 
and if you wish, parameterizes the point on a polynomial curve. And the variable q, which is uh, related to h bar in the usual way, such as q is exponential of h bar. Moreover, <coughs> with Chiprian, we proved several statements uh, about uh, invariance of three manifolds uh, that can be produced in a number of different ways by gluing pieces together such that result is still the same. In other words, we prove that in producing same manifold independently by doing different surgeries, you get the same answer. So it is indeed a feature of a three-dimensional TQFT where you can really do filling the toral boundary uh, in any way you want. So this is surgery formula, and again, statements of uh, what it satisfies can be found in this joint work with Ciprian. It takes uh, the series, which we saw on the previous slide as an input, this double series in Q and X, and basically integrates out the variable X, that meridian, substituting uh, for every power of X, roughly Q to the square of that power. So it's a convolution with a theta function, if you wish, but slightly, slightly more improved. So using this formula, uh, now, in fact, in front of you, I basically reconstructed this series for trefoil. It's very simple. For figure eight, it's a little bit more involved. But you can take the sensors and check that same manifold that you can produce by Dane surgeries on both trefoil and figure eight give the same result. And the result is a particular Q series in, in variable Q. So that's, uh, that's, that's, in some sense, this new interesting uh, feature or new interesting answer that has to do with SL2C Chern Simons theory, but non perturbatively. Not just as expansion in H bar, but really as, uh, as a concrete answer that associates function of Q to a three manifold, closed three manifold. So here, in this particular case, it also has interesting connections to vertex separator algebra. So this happens to be a character of uh, interesting VOA. Uh, with P42, so when Mike Friedman saw this, he immediately exclaimed that this is answer to hitchhikers uh, in hitchhikers uh, quest through the galaxy. <coughs> so this brings us to a question. So the, this this z hat, uh, this partition function, uh, is basically a, a new kind of TQFT which associates a Q series to close three manifold and a uh, series in X and Q to manifold with the toral boundary. And the question is, what kind of TQFT is this? Have we seen it before or not? So on the one hand, uh, it has some connections to known invariants. For example, it reproduces witten rishi tichin turai invariants if you take Q to be a root of unity. But when Q is generic, when it's inside the unit disk, I don't know uh, how it connects to any other invariants, so it seems to be new and therefore begs for some representation theoretic definition uh, when, when Q is inside the unit disk in terms of quantum groups at uh, generic values of Q. So as I try to explain, it basically is a non-perturbative definition of Chern simons complex Chern simons theory, something that we were trying to iteratively search through this vortex partition functions, Z without a hat, and many other uh, modifications which lack either gluing property or integrality or some other properties. Uh, you can actually view this as a Q-deformed version of TQFT that computes uh, inverse of the Turaev torsion. So Turaev torsion is a nice decorated TQFT where spin C structures play a role, and this invariance also actually know about spin C structures and uh, provide decorated TQFT, so it's a Q deformation of that. And um, Turaev theorem establishes relation between uh, usual topological quantum field theories in the language of um, IT, Fleur, and Siegel, and modular tensor categories. So if you ask what kind of modular tensor category would be relevant to this story, it's definitely non-semi-simple modular tensor category. So that's another kind of way of looking at it. And finally, I want to point out that uh, the reason we are actually interested in this, for example, main interest of Chiprin and many others, is that not that there is this interesting uh, three-dimensional TQFT that provides you uh, quantum invariance for generic values of Q, but rather that coefficients are integer in this Q expansion. So that means that it comes from a 4D TQFT 
Uh, and there is an interpretation of these integers in terms of counting of, of certain things. How do you know that the integer, by definition, you have some denominator? <coughs> th 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 that's right. So part of the, for example, I don't know if you told you about this, but uh, in our joint work with him and uh, Pavel, we proved some statements that, for example, for some classes of manifolds, we can just prove that there are integers. And conjecture, at least from physics, is that there are integers counting BPS states. Okay. Um, so there is a uh, counting behind it. And of course, uh, what's more exciting is uh, or to see that, that there is indeed such a homological interpretation. You want to basically introduce a T variable in the game or categorify this, this invariance. That's again trying to, to go in the T direction. And here is an example of, of how it works, for instance, if you take uh, simplest possible knot, namely unknot, and glue two unknot complements together. In this way, you can produce length spaces. So this invariance that have by itself for length spaces is very simple, but its categorification with a T variable is fairly involved and complicated. It's produced from this two F type invariance that I showed you before that depend on X. And of course, uh, as, as you could anticipate, this f now with the t dependence is annihilated by, by this deformation, a t deformation of the a polynomial that I explained before. Again, even though uh, I totally agree that this may not be mathematically rigorous object, I don't know if it exists or not, but again, there is a way to compute it and for, for pretty much every knot, and you can just check that this is indeed annihilated and uh, that's how you can find it. So <coughs> there are many interesting questions you can ask about uh, this, uh, this structure. So, um, or, or uh, the, yeah, I, I'm, I'm basically uh, gonna list the problems and uh, yeah, sorry I had to rush in the end, but there are many uh, hostile questions in the <laughs> meanwhile, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so obvious question is uh, to compute it in more general examples so we can learn something, we can uh, understand the structure of it. Uh, for example, there are many spe special geometric structures uh, you can try to use. If you're dealing with a fiber knot, you may expect that uh, the structure of a fibration could be useful. Or uh, you can try to define this Q-series invariants that had via Hewitt splitting. That's another way to build three manifolds, not just via surgery. And with Young and others, we are currently exploring this direction. Uh, then you can ask uh, whether there is a relation between uh, a polynomial and uh, the z hat invariant of uh, branched covers uh, of, of, of a knot. So both would depend on a knot, and the question is, are they, are they related? Uh, Appearance of this uh, vertex algebras and non semi simple modular tensor categories uh, also begs for some understanding explanation. <coughs> uh, role of uh, spin C structures and, and relation to this 1 over 2 rive torsion TQFT that I mentioned. And uh, finally, because all of this uh, is supposed to be uh, producing a Q series, which is naturally expanded near Q equals 0, natural question is. Uh, can we have a representation theoretic definition of this TQFT analogous to witten rishi tikhin drive? If the answer is yes, it means that we have to be working with quantum groups at Q equals zero or near zero, because that's, that's where Q series expansion basically makes sense and is defined. And uh, crystal bases are uh, standard tools to deal with quantum groups uh, at Q equals zero, so my guess would be that they could be useful in this um, in this endeavor. Thank you. So what do you Are count? Any uh, questions? What do you count in 4D? <coughs> in 4D, uh, well, I, I don't know a good uh, answer to this question. So um, it's, it's easier for me to connect it to the talk uh, from previous week that, that you've heard, where the counting is, uh, it, it's a counting of open BPS states, basically. So in that context. So you take three manifold, you produce T star of a three manifold out of it, and you count open BPS states in that context. <coughs> Sorry, what is AK Teichmiller theory? Uh, Anders and Kashaev. Questions or comments? Okay, so thanks for being again.